Oh my God, he's so cute. <laughs> he had this very boyish kind of air about him. I believe every woman who ever saw Marvin Gaye had a crush on Marvin Gaye. You must understand at that time I was totally obscure as an artist and uh, I hadn't even had a single record or anything. I was just a musician, a studio musician, a session drummer and songwriter and trying to hustle my way around in Motown. Marvin was surrounded by a remarkable array of talent. The Miracles, Martha and the Vandellas, and the Temptations. In terms of black popular music, black people had not had an institution like Motown. When it got around that this was becoming a mecca, people started going up that way. Most of the people that came to Barry Gordy at that time had absolutely no clue of what we were to do and how we were to achieve it. We were expecting Barry Gordy to make us a star. He was just not building a group of artists, he was building a name. 29-year-old Barry Gordy was Motown's founder and driving force. A former boxer and factory worker, Barry Gordy had a grand ambition to make Motown the general motors of the recording industry. Oh yes, Motown was much like the factory that Barry Gordy had worked in and with the assembly line. Take the song from the writer, give it to the producer. Producer, give it to the artist. Producer, then turn it over to the engineers. You didn't even get to mix your own music then. Everybody had a job or designated whatever your expertise was in, and that's what you did. Many people think that the Motown family is mythical. They think that it cannot possibly have been that everybody there had a family-type relationship. But that's exactly how it was. We all dated each other, you know what I mean? It was, it was that kind of thing. This was our neighborhood. And we just went in there and it was, everybody wanted to come there. Barry Gordy's sister, Anna, worked at the company. She was 36. Marvin was just 21. Before long, they were an item. She was older. But you know how young men like older women and older women like younger men. And I don't think they were thinking about age. It was just an attraction. No, Anna was a good-looking woman. Anna, oh, her own. Anna was looking good. Anna was a good-looking woman. Anna was a fine woman. Yeah. I would have married her. I'm 17 years old. I would have married her. I believe one of the reasons that Marvin was attracted to her was because I think she reminded him of his mother. Then I'm sure that the fact that she was the sister of the president of the record company didn't hurt any either. With his marriage to Anna, Marvin was entitled to a seat at the Motown family table. But always rebellious, he yearned to carve out his own musical identity. He wanted to be part of Motown. He just didn't want to sing Motown. I was a bit spoiled. I was a prima donna. I was the president's brother-in-law. And I was rather ridiculous about things that the other acts were doing. I don't know. I seemed to sort of enjoy being able to say, I don't have to do that. You guys do that. You know, I don't have to do that. Quiet nights with quiet stars, quiet chords from my guitar, floating on the silence that surrounds us. If you think about how he begins at Motown, here he is at a company that has discovered it has sort of teenage hits, kind of a new fangled rhythm in blues. And he doesn't want to do it. He wants to sit on a stool and smoke a cigarette and be cool. He wants to be Frank Sinatra. Ambitious as he was, Marvin's dream was to reach a wider audience, white as well as black. He says, no, I'm not going to give you rhythm and blues. And he's able to cut an album of standards, of a kind of a jazzy Frank Sinatra style. But it doesn't work. Marvin couldn't pull that off because the people weren't buying that on the records during that time. And then he suddenly is looking around and he's seeing 
Mary Wells has a head, and Smokey Robinson and the Miracles have a head. Because he's a competitive person, he wants to hit. He writes and sings a song called Stubborn Kind of Fella. So even when he capitulates, he does it with a kind of a defiant honesty that will be his hallmark throughout his career. Marvin was a genius, but he was a very competitive person. Marvin wanted to get there first, he wanted to be acknowledged as the only one, and he wanted to be seen as the superior one. When he's on stage with, you know, Stevie Wonder, and, and Stevie Wonder goes out and really basically kicks his butt, <laughs> you know. I mean, who's going to compete against Stevie Wonder? He's blind, he's a kid, and he's a genius. That's a hell of a combination. <laughs> And Marvin was not nice <laughs> in the way he framed it. Don't let that little blind sucker go on before me anymore. He wanted to do things his way, first of all, what he thought was the right road to take for his career. And a lot of times Barry and him would disagree on things like that, and they would argue uh, profusely. I couldn't deal with many of the political problems that I had to encounter at Motown. And many times it uh, sort of spilled over into personal disagreements and in some cases, some violent, uh, semi-violent disagreements between Barry and myself. Despite his conflicts with the company, Marvin turned out a string of hits. In less than two years, his dreams were realized. He was a star and a sex symbol. Marvin was the most versatile, probably R&B singer, soul singer, of the era, maybe of all time, because Marvin could sing a mellow, he could sing raw, he could sing soft, he could sing a little falsetto. He was a person who could sing any kind of music you put in front of him. And I mean, really sing it. He would marvelize it. And he would do some stuff that, you know, I wanted to keep everything he did on every take and just put it all on the record, but you couldn't do that, you know. Marvin was a true recording artist in that he was happy in the studio because he could control his environment. He was uncomfortable as a performer. He had performance anxiety. When we went on the Motown Review tours, we had to stand backstage and help him to, to learn how to do the hitchhike because he couldn't, he couldn't really dance. Oh, he looked very awkward. Couldn't dance a lick. Couldn't dance a lick. He paid his foot like a white boy. <laughs> I used to say Marvin. As I think about Marvin, I say, he's someone that was so brilliant, but so unsure. We just stand there and just watch him on the side of the, the stage. And he was just, and even in his not knowing how to dance, he was so beautiful. And how can you not know how beautiful you are? Marvin was the prince of Motown, but it was an uneasy crown he wore. He was filled with doubt about his fame. Even